Ash, and I call the honourable member for Macquarie. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for his very heartfelt words. Relentless. That's how this summer has been for people living in the Hawkesbury and the Blue Mountains, as it has been for many people around the East Coast and in South Australia. Our fires began in late October and our first evacuation happened in early November in Woodford. Our first declared catastrophic day was the 12th of November and it hasn't really stopped since then. As I drove to Canberra on Sunday, the fire was again at a watch and act level. That's the second highest level. We've thought of nothing but fire and smoke for months. We've worried and we've waited. And for some, the waiting has resulted in destruction. And for many, it's resulted in trauma. It's an understatement to say that it's been an anxious summer. This was not just one fire. This was fires all around us without the sea to the east to provide even one side of sanctuary. This was Gospers Mountain, Gross Valley, Ruined Castle, Green Mile and Erskine Creek fires. The Gospers Mountain fire has been described by the RFS incident controller, was told to her that it was the largest fire recorded in the world from a single ignition point. It was in the heart of Blue Mountains World Heritage. The lightning strike was impossible to get to early, and from there it spread. Given the conditions, the drought, the winds, the fact that this area is already one of the most bushfire-prone places on the planet, the fire behaviour was constantly described by the professionals as unusual or surprising. In the middle of the night, with high humidity, it was still racing up the sides of valleys. With all that, we know we were relatively lucky. We count ourselves relatively lucky on the lives that weren't lost in our region, but we know how close we came, and we join others in mourning the lives tragically taken by these firestorms, whether on the ground or in the air. As a community, we have watched with relief and heard the welcome sound of planes and helicopters as they carried water and fire retardant to combat the flames, travelling from our RAF base at Richmond or the various helicopter staging posts around the electorate. I have seen from the air how that retardant has saved so many homes in the Colo Heights region, right across, stretching across to Mount Victoria, the full spectrum of where the fires travelled. But we felt the loss of those three US firefighters, aerial firefighters who were doing such a difficult job, and I heard their C-130 take off from Richmond that morning and not return. Our hearts go out to their families. Only a week earlier, I had been at the RAF base with the our Shadow Minister to, for Defence and our Emergency Services Shadow Minister, speaking with fellow pilots and airmen about their work, its challenges and its satisfaction. I want to acknowledge their work uh, and also the support provided to them by the RAF base Richmond. And I, I'd also acknowledge the ADF work that's happening on the ground, but for us, the Richmond RAF base was the real hub of that aerial fighting, and we certainly want to see more of it. In the Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains, we count ourselves relatively lucky on what didn't burn. The thousands of homes we didn't lose. The businesses that are still standing, although they're empty because people are staying away. And thanks to the efforts of so many, most of our views are still magnificent. Most of our gardens are still splendid. And the apple pies are more delicious than ever. But we are deeply saddened by what's been destroyed and the trauma people have endured as they've watched the fire burn their homes and properties as they fought that fire. For people in Colo Heights, Bilpin, Barambing, Mount Toma, Mount Wilson and Bell, the 44 homes and the businesses lost is devastating. And when you include places like the McDonald Valley, Webbs Creek, Mount Irvine, Mount Victoria, Blackheath and the Megalong Valley, which all faced weeks, if not months, of fire activity. The region faces the replacement of dozens of small accommodation, outbuildings, sheds and hundreds of kilometres of fences. 
These things do feel overwhelming at times for our community. But as well as the businesses and properties, we've got our agriculture, our orchards, our grapevines, our pastures. The fires on top of that took so much of the wildlife that we've carved our niche in between. At least 80 per cent of the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage, Heritage Area has been burned through. That's nearly a million hectares. This is beyond anything that has happened before, and we don't really yet know what recovery is going to look like. The effect on the breeding and feed, feeding habitats of the brush-tailed rock wallaby, which has been mentioned by the member for Gilmore, which has very few and small places that it breeds. They, all of them in our region have had fire through them. Our swamps have burned. And yet, the only known Wallamai pine grove that, that has been there for long before any humans walked this earth was saved. These are the little things we hold on to that give us hope for the future. And, and there was a particular koala who lifted all our spirits during the fires, thanks to the Gross Wild RFS Brigade. Kevin the koala, it was known as, although it turns out that it's actually Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> but the saving of one koala, when we know so many others have been lost, are the things that we hold on to. Lives have been changed by this spring and summer. For the volunteer and paid staff, whether they were rural fire service or national parks and wildlife or fire and rescue, who faced the fires day in and day out, whether they are on the front line or in making decisions in the incident command, knowing that those decisions would have an impact on people's lives, we owe them such a debt. The summer has changed them. Some started fighting the fires at Tenterfield and, after months of volunteering, are now still supporting RFS crews down on the south coast. They work 12 to 15 hour days. These were not days in pleasant air conditioning. These are hot, dirty, sweaty, smoky days. And by Christmas they were exhausted. And that was still when there were weeks to go. Deputy Speaker, if you've never been in an incident control room, you've never seen the faces of people like fire controllers Karen Hodges and Greg Wardle and David Crust as they get a weather forecast or a drone report and realise what the day might have in store or what the night did hold, as they get reports of 30-metre flames or 60-metre flames, of flameovers of crews and homes of knowing that the decision to light up a backburn might work or it might not, but it's your only hope of slowing a fast-moving fire that isn't for turning, of making decisions knowing that animals will not be able to escape the flames fast enough, and knowing that the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area listed for its biodiversity will stand no chance, of knowing that the members of the RFS were busy saving other people's homes as their own homes were destroyed and under threat, of knowing the seriousness of what we faced. Yet their own feelings were set aside as they managed the safety and morale of their people who are on the front line and those who support them, the SES, police, ambulance, some of whom found themselves facing flames that they hadn't imagined. We have asked so much of them. We've asked too much of them. Their lives have changed as have the lives of many who supported them, the volunteers from Rotary, the church groups, people who just stepped up and in so many ways, day after day. It was a privilege to be an unremarked on attendee at daily briefings, the handover between a night shift and a day shift, or a day shift and a night shift, and to work alongside the dedicated Mayor of the Blue Mountains, Mark Greenhill and the New South Wales Shadow Minister for Emergency Services and local member for the Blue Mountains, Trish Doyle, who lived this far as a parent with a frontline firefighter, not just a politician. Also the Hawkesbury Mayor, Barry Calvert, and State Member Robin Preston, all of whom cared about what was happening in their communities. For those whose homes did not survive the firestorms, who are being forced to deal with the grief of losing things that you feel hold your memories, and the gigantic and, and overwhelming task of starting again, and I know because we've only just managed to move back into our house after a rebuild six years later, 
and I know life will never be the same. There will always be before the fire and there will be after the fire. But people are being forced to make decisions they weren't ready to make and should never be asked to make about where they live, about the work they do, about what more sacrifices they make, because in too many cases their insurance will not be enough to allow them to replace the home that they had. And I say to those people, it is impossible to imagine right now when the loss is so raw, but provided we give you the support that you need when you need it, you will get there bit by bit and find a way through the fog that envelops you. For those whose properties were destroyed, whether it was a cafe like the much-loved Tutti Frutti at Bilpin, or thousands of apples or figs, or a mud-brick bungalow that housed a building business, there is also a dreadful sense of loss. Sitting in the gallery today are a group of people going through a mix of all these things I've mentioned. Residents from the broader Bilpin region, Barambi and Currajong Heights, all along the Bells Line of Road in the beautiful Hawkesbury, whose lives have all been changed by these fires. Now, these guys got up on a bus at six o'clock this morning to be here because hearing what we said was so important to them. And they also want to show the resilience and the strength that they have in the face of some immense personal tragedies and loss. And I join them in the determination to see our region revitalised. We <laughs> we have Helen, who lost her home, Margaret and Simon, who've lost half their huge apple orchard and many figs, just as fig season was coming in. Lionel and Corinne and Lachelle, who all have accommodation, which is now burnt around and they have no one to come and stay in it, but even in its burnt state is stark, just starkly beautiful. And Yana, Matilda, Annette and Greg, and John, who has had the trauma of the fire followed by a devastating loss of a son. And I really thank you all for making the effort to be here. This is the sort of community that we have. They know that we have much to do to recover from these fires and to learn the lessons that they present. Their lives, like so many around St Albans, Mount Tomar, Mount Irvine, Megalong and Bell, were at greater risk because of the fragility of the phone systems. Landlines failed and there's no mobile coverage in so much of these areas. We can't ignore those issues, and Telstra needs to take a leaf out of the book of Endeavour Energy. They got in fast when the fire moved through and reconnected electricity. Uh, but unfortunately, many people are even now without phone lines. The recovery has to begin, even as the fires burn elsewhere or nearby. In fact, this is a lesson for governments to learn. Not only was there a delay in recognising the seriousness of this fire season, but the recovery has been far too slow. And that's why we face a second crisis in our region, in the Hawkesbury and the Blue Mountains. Since November, visitors have stayed away, and every part of the local economy is feeling it. Small businesses have had to reduce shift for workers, with casuals the first to go. Their takings are down by 70 or 80 per cent in what is usually their best season. 300 businesses joined me last week to share their pain in the Blue Mountains and beg for urgent support. Today, the government has released details of its promised small business concessional loans, up to $50,000 over five years for businesses who need help with cash flow. I welcome this as a useful measure, but it will not be welcomed by every small business who fear additional debt and I will continue to tell the relevant ministers what the needs are in my community. I do want to thank the Minister for Emergency Management, David Littleproud, for reaching out during the fires and for bringing the head of the recovery, Andrew Colvin, along with the Foreign Minister, to the Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains to hear these things directly from constituents. My own leader, Anthony Albanese, was a rock during the fires, as was Shadow Minister uh, Senator Watts. They were untiring in their support of my community, in wanting to see what more could be done. Uh, these are the sorts of things that make it possible to go through a fire season like this and, and maintain 
your belief that this parliament is made up of really good people who really want to make a difference. I was also grateful for the support of the member for Eden Monero and Gilmore, those phone texts where we could share what we were going through at different stages of the fires uh, were <laughs> a lovely little lifeline at times. I really hope the spirit of cooperation continues. I urge people to resist the temptation to do political point scoring. I certainly won't be. But I have no intention of shying away from robust discussion on the issues that matter, even as we mourn. And we will need more targeted assistance to get my community through this. We want to see local access to and input into the tourism funding that's been announced. We need to shout loudly to the world that the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury are open for business, but it needs to be a coordinated campaign across all the impacted areas. We each have different things to offer. And while I love a hashtag campaign, that is not going to get us the visitors that we need. Surely now is also the time to bring insurers to the table, to demand a better deal for customers so that the underinsurance that I experienced and people are facing every day is not repeated fire after fire. It's bittersweet to me that, as a result of reading of my experience, one family in Bell increased their home insurance only a short while before their home was destroyed. Having a good insurance policy does make your rebuild a little less difficult. It makes your choices easier. In fact, what it does is give you choice. Um, there's been mention of the ABC, and I want to add to that. Uh, when your landline dies, your power goes off, which means your mobile signal through your Wi-Fi fails, then all you have is the ABC. And how lucky we are to have it. You don't have your fires near me app, you don't have Facebook, and you don't have any way to communicate with people. You listen to those wonderful ABC reporters and presenters telling you in detail exactly where the fires spread, hoping that you don't hear a mention of your own suburb or your street. It was such compelling broadcasting that one night, one Saturday night, I listened to the horrors unfolding down south thanks to the ABC and Simon Marnie, very human, bringing to our lounge rooms just what was happening. We must ensure that these broadcasts are properly resourced. These fires could have been worse, but for some major strategic hazard reductions. And we need to ensure that New South Wales national parks are properly funded to be able to do the ones they think will really make the difference, based on the best information. We also must have a conversation about what landholders should do on their own properties and how we can incorporate traditional burns. We all know there's more we could do in this area. Another lesson is planning. And, you know, I can't pretend that none of us can pretend that this won't happen again as much as we hope that this is a one-off. All the science tells us that this may well be the new norm unless we act. Governments, federal, state and local government need to have the best plans in place, as do charities and not-for-profit groups, so that they can activate much faster. And how we make sure we've got people on the ground willing to wear that yellow uniform and that our fire and rescue teams know how to defend in bushfire situations is vital. And I want to finish with the obvious, the thing that you can't ignore, the role that climate change played in exacerbating these fires. It's my community that's already paying the cost of climate change. Not metaphorically, but literally. We're paying higher insurance. We're paying higher building costs. We're paying for fire systems that we haven't needed before. That's a cost being borne by individuals. We've paid in a season of sadness, and the mental health impacts are simply unknown. I don't think we can accept that all we should do is adapt. Our wise volunteers and those who construct out of the men's sheds, the water feeding stations, need to know that we will take seriously our responsibility to not just rehabilitate our national park, but to protect it in the future and to protect the animals that they are working so hard to keep alive. 
We have paid in a season that changes what summer is. As we mourn the losses and we honour the efforts of all those, we know how much worse it could have been. But we may, must make sure that none of this was in vain. Thank the member for Macquarie.